Welcome to Central Community. It is fantastic to have you with us this morning. We are doing a new broadcast. We are broadcasting to everything live this morning. So if there's a hiccup in there, we apologize. And if it's better than ever and you're seeing us for the first time on YouTube Live or on Facebook or on our website at the same time, let us know. Send us a note. Tell us how happy you are to see it. Welcome to Central Community's online campus. Welcome to right here on our campus in person. You are invited to worship with us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to join together in worship this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to be a part of Central Community and all of her ministries. We thank you that the doors are open today, God. We think about the many places on the planet Earth where, because of whatever reason, whether it's political issues, whether it's poverty, whatever it is, God, that people don't have the kind of liberty we have this morning to worship together. And so we thank you, Father, for the opportunity that in so many of our lives we, we just didn't take advantage of for too long, God. And today we are here. Today we are worshiping. We thank you for the technology that allows us to reach out further than ever before, Father, and allows us to be on so many different forums. We would ask that you would just bless the feed as it goes out, God. We would ask that you would touch it, you would use it, that we would ask that you would be with the homes of people who are just now tuning in for those for the very first time and those who have been regular attendees on our feed. We would ask you bless each one of them, God. We think about the big issues in the world, Father, where people are already forgetting the, 
folks in Libya who had the horrible floods or the folks in Morocco where the earthquake struck or right in our own nation where it just seems like there's division politically, God, and while people just are waiting to be fed and be loved, God, we would ask that you would use us as your church, Father, to meet the needs that you long for us to meet, to be the people that you long for us to be, God. We would ask that this morning could be another step in surrender, God, in following you. We thank you so much for loving us. We would ask that you would use us to be your people of peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the 1990s, I had a great idea for bab. Hi, Shannon. I've been missing you. It's good to see you. In the 1990s, I had a great idea for baptisms at Central Community. I thought what we'll do is we'll do them all on Easter Sunday, no matter what, no matter when someone wants to be baptized. I was criticized from time to time about this. 
because people would say, you need to keep water in the baptism pool. We have, that's a baptism pool up there on the front behind the cross um, all the time. Anytime someone gives their heart to Jesus that way, you can just walk them up there and baptize them right then. And I'd say, well, you know, it's not the way it was done in the Bible. It's not the way. So what we're going to do is we'll just do our baptisms on Easter Sunday. And in my mind, it was a way to build attendance on Easter. It was a way that all through the year I could just tell people, you know what, you want to be baptized? Easter Sunday's your day. You want to invite everyone. And for a whole year, we were building to that. And then we had a guy in the church who a couple months ago came to me and said, Pastor, I've given my heart to the Lord, a friend of mine. I want to be baptized. I said, great, Easter Sunday is your time. No, 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 I want to be baptized on this day. Yeah, I want to be baptized. In fact, it was yesterday. I want to be baptized on this day. And, you know, he's, um, he runs a business called BigBearGuide.com. He's from the mountains. He said, I want to be baptized in Big Bear Lake up in Fawnskin. He says, weather's been beautiful. No problem. Was the weather beautiful yesterday? Not beautiful. And if you were in the mountains where I was yesterday, I was in Vaughn Skin yesterday. I was in Big Bear Lake yesterday with the weather at 39 degrees, the wind blowing 40 miles an hour across the lake on an exposed beach blowing right on us, getting ready to speak as I was thinking, oh, I'm going to die of hypothermia. I see this. And my father's last baptism, gospel truth, he was my age, he was 69 years old, and he was baptizing someone inside a building, and he went into hypothermia and was hospitalized for a week. And I'm thinking, okay, he was an outdoors, in the wind, all blowing on him, waiting for some guy to come down in and try to get him underneath the water. Pat, this guy, Dan, he says to me, Pastor, aren't you going to get in a little deeper? And I said, no, <laughs> not. This is all the further I'm going, as cold as this lake is right here. And he says, well, I don't think you can get me down. I said, no, but you can. You go all the way, buddy. <laughs> and I thought about what a great idea I had back in the 90s, keeping all that. I thought, this, if I baptize anyone else in my entire ministry, Dan may have been the last, but if I do, it'll be next Easter. That's when it'll be something. If you want to be baptized, it'll be right then. And I thought about the decisions that we make that draws us into a point like this. Now, Dan loves the mountains. Dan has been working up in there and spent his entire lifetime up there. He had invited all of his family and friends up there. He had hired a band. I mean, a band out there on the park at the marina. He had picnic. He had a crowd of folks that he knows. And he had written a poem. He had shared his testimony. It was as beautiful as you could want. And everyone was bundled in down jackets, raincoats, with fires going out there on the thing, and them not even making a dent against the first cold of the year. And I had to say, Dan, you keep on sharing. No one's going to love God anymore. We need to get into that water, and we need to go down. And I thought about how sometimes life just doesn't go exactly the way we planned. Now, he said, Pastor, all week long the weather's been beautiful. It's been gorgeous up here. I've been out here, it's been perfect. And I said, yeah, sometimes it just happens that way. That's, and have you had your life like that sometimes? It seems like things were just going along perfectly. There was money in the bank, your body was healthy, things were good, everything's going okay. I mean, I was the oldest guy in the crowd. I was expecting like his parents and grandparents to be there. He's 10 or 15 years younger than me. I was expecting to be a whole bunch of old folks around. I was the oldest guy in the crowd by at least 10 years. People are putting their hands on my arms. They go, can I help you, sir, down towards the water? And I'm saying, yeah, I think maybe, you know, (laughs) as I shiver my way down to the water. And I'm thinking, sometimes life just doesn't always go the way we plan. And that's the reason I've been talking about those great big questions that we have about theology and about God and about our relationship with Jesus that are just too big to ignore. And that's why last week we talked about what happens when we die. We talked about, you know, God's big plan for the end. We're talking about all of those kinds of things. Next week, message you don't want to miss at home or here. I'm going to talk about hell, sin, and all that other stuff. All those things that I usually just blow off completely here at Central Community, I'm going to talk about, and that's literally the title of the sermon, Hell, Sin, and All That Other Stuff. And so I'm going to cover 
all of those things that, that we just usually don't talk about too often here. But for this morning, the card's inside your program, and it's on the website if you're online watching there. And the text this morning is from Romans, the eighth chapter. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome. For those of you who have been to Rome, you're familiar with what it's like. I mean, it's not like he knew these people. It's not like he was good friends with these people. He was writing this note of abundant encouragement to them. And so if you think, well, I didn't know Paul. Well, you know, yeah, and he didn't know you either. But the Holy Spirit has protected it for all these years, so it would be this incredible encouragement to us. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? Now, Paul's been going over all the big issues of life, kind of like I've been going over, you know, those great big questions that are too big to ignore. And so he says, what shall we say then in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, that's probably enough right there, isn't it? Let's say that out loud together. If God is for us, who can be against us? And you're already thinking about people, aren't you? You're already thinking about, oh, pastor, I can give you a long list of the folks who have been against us. And he's not saying there aren't going to be people who are going to stand in objection to you. What he's saying is, is that you've got God on your side. And anybody who stands against you stands against God. And so if God is for us, really, what kind of strength is there in this world that can stand against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies unbelievably. Can you believe this right here? There is an entire theology built around justification. And that's what it's called. It's called justification. Have you, but have you been justified? And it comes from just like words here in the scripture. And it's astonishing what humanity does with God's word. We take it and we say, well, it's so important that you've been justified. Now, how many of us really know what it means to be justified? For those of you who say, well, I know what it means to be justified, Pastor Eric. You learned in Sunday school, right? You learned when you read a book, right? I mean, you learned when you did something. And really, I mean, maybe the Apostle Paul wasn't even talking about anything like that. But it's essential to us that we don't focus so heavily on one word in God's word. It is God who justifies who then is the one who condemns? No one. Anyone ever condemn you? Again, you can think of some people who have said some condemning things about you before, haven't you? I mean, believe me, we could fill the church with people who have left the church because they didn't think Pastor Eric was right at some point across the last 36 years. People who have said one thing or the other about me at some time or the other in all the different places. And imagine if the first time someone said something bad about about me, I decided to say, well, yeah, well, I'm done. I'm done with my job. I'm done with following God, if that's the way it's going to go. But you see, we have to live in that faith that it's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. It's Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life, he's at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. That means we have an advocate in Christ Jesus, the one who stands at the right hand of God, and when we're thoroughly boneheads, he still loves us, and he intercedes on our behalf for you and me, Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ loves us. Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Who shall separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus? It says, shall trouble, and there are seven of these points here, just in case you want to mark them down, because it doesn't matter which language you look at, and there are seven points here, and it's, it's basically covering the great big problems of humanity here. Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or the sword. I mean, most of us haven't faced those things, right? Everyone in here is well-clothed, right? So you're not dealing with 
nakedness. Now, maybe you know Henry on our street. We saw Henry just yesterday. Debbie and I did yesterday afternoon. We drove down. His pants were dropping off completely. He was standing in the middle lane of Arlington again. Debbie said, Eric, you don't think we should stop and help Henry? Debbie had just gotten off an airplane coming from Seattle. And I said, honey, I kind of think Henry knows what he's doing this time. I've talked to him several times this week. I think this is his method of panhandling. And my heart was broken for him, but even more, this is what I say on the streets when I talk to people who are living on the street. I say, you know, I wouldn't make fun of Henry, that could be you. When Henry was in elementary school, he didn't anticipate standing in the middle of Arlington Avenue with his pants falling down. He didn't anticipate when he was in high school having his mental health escape him. He didn't anticipate any of these things. And the life you're living today, you didn't anticipate this either. And for us, whether it's trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or even the sword, for us, we don't know when these things are going to come, but these things cannot separate us from the love of Christ. It says, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. <laughs> now he's talking about those who follow Christ Jesus. He's saying, follow Christ Jesus. It's not live your best life now. It's not a great smile on television. It's not how to be rich. It's we are living as sheep being led to the slaughter. Why? Because the Lamb of God, what happened to him? He was led to the slaughter at the cross for us. And for each of us, the promise that comes is that it say we're willing to follow. It says, no, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What have we conquered? Have we conquered heartache or nakedness or the problems of the world or hunger or any of those things? Or have we conquered our own struggles? Have we conquered ourselves and our own sins and we've said, we're here for Jesus. We surrender all. We're here for whatever he wants and whatever he chooses to do with this body of mine, his business. Because he is Lord of my life. For I'm convinced. That's great. Whenever you see someone say, for I'm convinced, that's pretty important, whatever comes next. It's the Apostle Paul saying, for I'm convinced. You got to love the King James here. Though, do you know what the King James says? You learned it in a song at some point. For I am persuaded, for I am persuaded, for I am persuaded, or I am convinced, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. Is he trying to eliminate pretty much everything here? Is he trying to kind of cover every single dispute that can come up against him? Nothing. He goes through it, height nor death, angels, demons, no matter what. And then he finally just says, in fact, anything in not just the planet Earth, but in all of creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And if you can't say amen to that, you can't say amen to nothing, friends and neighbors, I'll tell you what. That's where you and me need to be able to say amen. And say that, I want you to know when I was standing ready to get into the water on the side of Big Bear Lake yesterday, I was thinking about this morning's message. I was thinking, nothing could separate me from the love of God. And if this is my moment to go down into there, I turned around and I had jeans on over a bathing suit. And I needed to take those jeans on. And now I was standing in front of more people than I'm standing of now. And they were all looking right at me. 
And I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to do that right in front of all these people. So I turned my back to the lake where these people weren't facing, and I had buttons so I could pull down and have my jeans off and my bathing suit on. But now the back of the lake was to my back, and I took one step backwards, not seeing the rock that was behind me and the lake right behind the rock. And I was standing on a slant, and over right towards the lake I went, and a young man reached out and grabbed my hand and said, let me help you, Pastor. And he pulled me right up, and I thought, thank you, Jesus. I'm thinking that would have been so embarrassing to go right down right there. Someone else said, you know, Pastor, there are docks right over there. I said, yeah. He said, one of the ways to baptize Dan, who's wanting to be baptized, said, walk him to the dock, said, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and push him right in. And I said, don't think I'm not considering it right now as I wandered on down into the water. But I, things don't always go as planned. You don't think that you're going to get older. You don't think you're going to be standing in the cold in a bathing suit. You don't think that you're going to be lumbering over as some young man reaches out to help you. And yet, there it is. Life goes right to that spot. And there you are. And it's you in that spot. And even in that moment, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And for us to hold on to it and remember that's on the front of your card this morning. It says, God shows his never-ending love and care, first of all, when no one stands, when we need them, and we're left alone. Because which one of us hasn't been in that moment when we were falling, and there wasn't someone there to grab us? When we were going down and that hand wasn't reaching out to us, which one of us hasn't experienced that lonely drop into the metaphoric cold lake and thought to ourselves, how in the world did I get into this lonely spot? And for you, it might have been when you were in the hospital. And I'm firmly convinced there's almost no place more lonely than the hospital in the middle of the night when you wake up and you think to yourself, how in the world did I find myself in the hospital tonight? But maybe it was when a loved one passed away. Maybe it was when a loved one left you and you were suddenly in a broken relationship. For each of us, there are those moments when we suddenly find ourselves that the people we were depending on to stand next to us aren't. And in that moment, Christ Jesus stands firm, and we need to remember, if God is for us, who can be against us? Even in this moment of desperate loneliness, even in this moment of more difficulty than I ever imagined in my life, God has not abandoned me. God has not left me. And God is still with me. Yesterday I was talking with some people. One of them was telling about their heartbreak. I was sharing about how I'd been through a similar heartbreak. I was young and I was telling a funny story about it and they said that's funny that you could tell a funny story about something that's so sad and I said you know it's interesting as you get older you can look back on things that at the moment devastated you and 50 years later you laugh about them I mean what can you say it's it's the way life works it's the way we process things in the moment we think something will kill us but what's the old saying? You know, what doesn't kill you does what? Makes you stronger. Yeah, I don't believe it half the time. We especially don't believe it when it's trying to kill you. But when you survive it, there's a way that we make it through. I love the quote. It says, God's love knows no boundaries. It reaches out to every soul regardless of who they are or where they've been. God's love knows no boundaries. Maybe you know the story of Job. I skipped right over that verse at the very beginning. I'm Job 13, 15, and I apologize. It's on your card right at the very top in real small verses. It says, though he slay me, even still will I serve him. Though he slay me, 
Even still will I serve him. Do you know the story of Job? Most people do. Um, in our household, mom's favorite expression was, well, those folks are poor as Job's turkey. Have you ever heard that expression, poor as Job's turkey? I have no idea how poor Job's turkey was, but I'm guessing it meant that if Job was broke, his turkey must have really been broke. But that was something mom said all the time. Those folks, they're poor as Job's turkey. But Job, he was a good guy. He had everything. He had a big family. He was rich. You name it, he had it. And then Satan, the one who stands against us, was in the realm of the angels. And God looked at Satan and said, so, I'm just curious, where have you been, Satan? Satan, you go back, Job is literally like the oldest book in the scriptures. Go back to the Old Testament and read it again, doesn't take long. Um, Satan looks at him and says, well, I've been wandering the earth, just checking everything out. He said, God says, did you see my servant Job? Isn't he righteous? Isn't he great? And Satan says what you and me would say. He says, yeah, I'd be righteous and great too if I was the richest guy on the planet Earth. He's got everything. You take that away from him, he wouldn't be so great anymore. And so, I said, go ahead, take it away. Job will keep his faith. And so Satan takes it all away. His friends turn their back on him. He's got three interlocutors who argue with him and tell him how bad he is. He must have turned his back on God. He loses everything. In fact, one of my favorite verses from Job, his wife looks at him in the 10th chapter and says, Job, look what's happening to you. Why don't you curse God and die? You know when your wife says that to you, things are really bad. You know, why don't you curse God and die? And Job's entire theology is wrapped up in 1315, which is carried through so many people of faith across the centuries. Though he slay me, even still will I serve him. Because I've surrendered my life, my heart, my body to God, and whatever God wants with this, I belong to God. And to the very end, I belong to God. And for you and me to remember that, that God loves us. He does not belong to us. We do not own God. God is the uncreated one who we have the opportunity to serve. We have the opportunity to share. And when someone stands against us and we feel left alone, we are never alone. God is always with us. God is always beside us. God will never abandon us. It says God shows his never-ending love and care because the whole thing's talking about does God care about you, whatever it is that's going through your life right now? Does he care about that someone rejected you? Does he care about your personal heartbreak and temptation? So it says God shows his never-ending love and care when temptation and loss pull us away from living in love. When temptation and loss pull us away from living in love. And many of you know that some of my biggest temptation is just driving. I mean, just driving. You want to you have me really get tempted, put me behind the wheel of a car. You want to have me really get tempted, I'm not tempted to drink and drive, I'm not tempted to take drugs and drive, but I am tempted to be angry at every single idiot who pulls in front of me. I am tempted to accuse everyone around me of somehow being lesser creations just because they cut in front of me. I am tempted to be, I mean, it is one of my most difficult spots in creation. I mean, really, maybe I shouldn't drive just to avoid that portion of it. Maybe I should walk and ride a bicycle. I, I would probably go in a different direction. And you're saying, Pastor Eric, but that's not such a bad temptation. You know, for each of us, we have our own demons. For each of us, and as we clean our lives up, the demons just move into different areas sometimes. And for each of us, of us, those temptations we have to address because those temptations are the loss that pull us away from living in love. You know, when you see that car ahead of you and they stop right in a lane of traffic to let someone back out of their driveway, I'm the guy who honks the horn and think, What are you doing? What are you doing? Don't stop for that guy. And I always, Debbie, I'll say, Eric, you know, you should be a little bit nicer. And I'm thinking, Honey, 
that person could be backing out and they could cause an accident. I could get rear-ended, they're, they're just not safe what they're doing. The guy backing out needs to wait till no cars. I mean, I try to explain it with the logic of driving. Calm down, sweetheart, calm down. You know, I can get worked up when I'm not even behind the wheel of a car. And temptation does that to us. And for each of us, temptation is that loss that pulls us away from living in love. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Friends, no one but you. No one but you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your friends do. It doesn't matter what your coworkers do. It doesn't matter what politicians do. It doesn't matter what's on TV. What matters is what's inside of you. You're the only one that can separate you from the love of God. That's it. No one else can. I can't blame the person backing out at a stupid time or the person stopping at the wrong time. I can't blame any of those things. It's all about how I address my issues. And whatever your temptation is, it's all about how you address your issues. And you say, yeah, but I'm dealing with great loss. Everyone that you see, especially as we get older, is dealing with great loss. No one that you know has not experienced great loss. And for all of us to understand that it's about me knowing that nothing can separate me from the love of God except me. I can put up that barrier and even then, God loves me. And like a parent looks at me and thinks, Eric, how stupid can you be? Come on. I mean, even then, God longs to reach out and embrace us. It says God's love is the foundation of our faith, the motivation for our actions, and the hope in our hearts. I just love the way Billy Graham said things, you know. And for each of us to have that hope in our hearts on a daily basis, I love to think about the years I was in seminary. While I was in seminary, I hated seminary. I kid you not, going to school of theology with one more graduate, I would come home and complain to Debbie. I would literally go to a different university to study because if I studied at the university I was going for graduate school for theology, I would see people that would just make me angry by seeing them. I would see the professors, I would see the other people. I would go someplace else that had a larger library that made me feel smarter, and I would think, I'm just not even gonna go into that. And I know all of you are better than me, and you've never had any of those kinds of issues, but I learned how to just take evasive action just so I didn't even have to be around it. Now Thursday, I had a very quiet day around here. It was going to be busy eventually, and so I knew Thursday morning, Karen, Karen was handling something. We had a vaccination clinic going on. I didn't bother to get her on time. In fact, I thought about scheduling the day to go fishing. I'd called Karen, say, Karen, this is what's scheduled. I've scheduled this such stuff. Can you? Yeah, no problem, Pastor. I can handle that. She had let everyone. We had a whole bunch of medical people over in there. We had all this other stuff. And then suddenly, I thought I heard Teresa's voice in there. I'm yelling, hey, Teresa. And you know, Karen's talking to someone. And it was one of the nurses from the vaccination clinic where a dozen people over there sitting doing nothing because no, hardly anyone showed up for the vaccination clinic. And I go out there and this young man is trying to explain to Karen that there's a great big truck waiting to be unloaded for food. I knew a great big truck was coming to be unloaded for food. On Tuesday, Josh and Marty had helped unload 27,000 pounds of food that was donated through our USDA grant. And they had told me that after one o'clock, a truck driver would be here they would be there, take care of it. Perfect, thanks you guys. And I was in great shape. And at about 11.30 or 12, the truck showed up. While well, they're still not here. And the driver says, I need to get going. I can't wait for them. No worries, I'll get out the forklift. I put the forklift away before. I don't think I've ever gotten it out before. You're driving it backwards getting it out. It's scary. I was telling Josh about it. He said, oh, all of us have gone off those ramps before. And I got it out. I didn't go off the ramps. I was scared getting the forklift out, you know. And then there were eight or nine pallets that had to be unloaded. I mean, I think it was 17,000 pounds of food, he said, of food that had to be unloaded from that truck. 
And normally I've got Pastor Ken or Joshua or someone telling me, okay, move the forks this way, you hit the knob, do this. And now I'm all by myself driving a forklift. And I'm thinking, they didn't have this class in seminary. They didn't have this class in graduate school at Long Beach State. I, I've never taken a forklift class. And I unloaded every single bit of that great big truck. I mean, and in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if Greg Laurie's doing this right now. I wonder if he's out on a forklift in his parking lot right now. I, how, did, how did this come into my life that I am the guy, and Ken's somewhere on a cruise. He keeps posting pictures of the food, and Ken, he can get behind the wheel of that forklift and he can make it dance. I mean, you know, he just goes all over the place. I am like scared to death when I'm behind the wheel of that thing. And the driver obviously could see that. So every single time he'd say, okay, the fork's up a little bit higher, down a little bit lower, move that middle knob, go this way. And he's telling me exactly what to do. And I'm very obedient. I'm doing exactly what he says until we get the final thing off. Two of them or three of the pallets needed to go into the refrigerator. He said to me, look, Pastor, I'm so sorry you had to unload all of this. I said, that's not your fault. I was just so thankful he was up there with a pallet jack. Some truck drivers, one load we had, Josh was here in Marty Rear, the guy never even got out of the truck. He slept through them unloading everything with them up inside the truck, them down driving the forklift, and the truck driver up in a cab sleeping. This truck driver was so gracious. He was so kind. And then he looked at me and said, Pastor, the stuff for the refrigerator if you'll go unlock your great big refrigerator, I can drive the forklift over there and put it away. And I said, that is so nice of you. Thank you so much. I said, but our guys, Josh and Marty, will be here pretty soon. I think it can hang out here for a while. They were there for, gone for another hour or so. And I thought, we had a pallet of cheese out there. I thought the peaches, there are peaches here today if you'd like peaches. I thought the peaches, um, they can hang out here no problem. That cheese probably shouldn't be sitting on the parking lot. Whole pallet of cheese. So I went out there and I opened up the refrigerator. I drove the cheese over there. I got in. I was so proud of myself getting in there all by itself between another pallet and all the other stuff. Got it in there just exactly right. I went to close the thing. I never opened that big refrigerator. It is so hard to close. Josh got here and I said, Josh, I got to tell you. I said, I got the cheese in there. I couldn't close the door completely, so the refrigerator's left a little bit of jar. No problem, Pastor. And I thought, I'm surrounded by so many people who love me and lift me up and take care of so many of the ministries we do. But I thought about, that's nothing compared to the big issues that we face in life, is it? That's nothing compared to the stuff that happens in our families and our finances with our health. When it seems like the wheels are coming off, now, when I was behind the wheel of the forklift coming down that ramp, feeling like if it tips over, I'm going to whack my head on the ground and my brains are going to slip out. In that moment, it felt like everything. But when I was all done, it felt like, oh, yeah, that was nothing. And when we're in the midst of our crisis, doesn't it feel like everything? And then when we get the forklift put away, it feels like, oh, yeah, it's nothing. And for each of us, we need to understand that that temptation to feel like this is everything right now. We need to remember Job 13, 5, though he slay me, even still will I serve him. And when your wife or your husband or your kids are looking at you and they're saying, why don't you just curse God and die? What's wrong with you? Why are you continuing to remain faithful? We remember Job 13, 5, though he slay me, even still will I serve him. And God is not slaying you. God is not after you. This is us. And so finally, God shows his never-ending love and care when heartbreak blinds us and we can't feel God nearby and which one of us hasn't been in that spot. When heartbreak just absolutely blinds us, we don't feel God nearby. And, you know, we want to feel God. But you see, God's not here for us to feel, for us to touch. Otherwise, it wouldn't be about faith. Faith is about us believing that God is always with us even when we can't feel him. It says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In all these things, we are more than conquerors 
through him who loved us. By the time I had Dan under the water, it's an amazing thing to see someone get baptized. And I baptized in oceans, I baptized in lakes, I baptized here, so many, I don't know how many people I baptized, but so many places. But it never fails. Right when I had him under the water, the sun kind of broke through the clouds for just a second. And it was glorious. I could look straight down into the water and I could see his face. And there was just kind of like the light shining on it. And then I lifted him up out of the water and I said to him, stand up, buddy, I can't lift you anymore. My back was hurting, my left shoulder was hurting, everything. he weighs about what I weigh. And so he stood up as I lifted him, made me look strong as I'll get out, you know. And he stood up. And he looked like he was going to go into hypothermia. I was doing okay. And, and, and his wife came down, circled him up with blankets and hugged him and everything. He got out and he was just, he, was, he hadn't had a jacket. And I said, I thought this would help prepare me. And he was in, and they said, Pastor, can we get you anything? I said, just my towel, please, you know. And I had my towel waiting there, wrapped myself up. I was freezing, the wind's blowing, I'm soaked. I'm just, you know, I'm in wet clothes, wet shoes, wet everything. And so I started headed to the car, and they said, well, can we bring you some food? I said, sure, bring it on up. It's got to get here quick. There was a guy following me with a bag. I turned on the heater in the car. And I waited. I got out of the wet stuff as much as I could. Debbie was landing at the airport. I had to be there in an hour, and it's an hour and a half from up in Fonskin down to Ontario. I think, how am I going to do this? I start to leave, and now the rain's really coming down. I mean, it is raining, full force raining. It is raining. I, so I said, I'm not going to wait for the food they're bringing me. I, start, I just drove away. I didn't say goodbye to anyone. I just drove away with the heater on full blast. I drove away. I left everyone. I started coming down the mountain. Before I got to Arrow Bear, I had been through sleet. I had been through snow. And then just past Arrow Bear, I got into a hailstorm. There was no rain in it all that I could see. Just white. Everyone pulled off the road except me. Debbie was waiting for me, I knew. And so I was doing maybe three miles an hour. I wasn't going to tell her I had to pull off, wait for a hailstorm. as just solid hail. And then I made it through that hailstorm and then rain. And I'm thinking, why do people like the mountains? I'm, I'm thinking to myself, people love this. They buy houses up here. They love this. And I'm thinking, Ken should have been here for all of this, not me. Ken thrives on this kind of stuff. And I'm just creeping through. I mean, Ken would have been doing 50 miles an hour down this, and thinking, why is that guy going so slow? I'm just blinded by now, just buckets of rain coming down, only guy on the road. And then just like that, came down out of Running Springs, it stopped. Dry roads, I kid you not, dry roads, just like that, got down about 5,000, 4,000 feet, something like, the rest of the way, and not a drop. And Debbie gets off the plane, it's dry. It was raining where you were at. Honey, it wasn't just raining. You know, I'm telling you, and I'm thinking about how we meet people. We don't know about the storms they face, do we? We don't know about the hailstorm they survived. We don't know about the snow. We don't know about the sleet. We don't know about the mountaintop they stood on. We don't know about any of that. Me, I was just thankful to get down the mountain. I was so glad to be alive, so glad I don't drive a Volkswagen bug anymore. So thankful that I, I mean, when the windshield wipers go like this and it's not helping a lick, I was just so thankful. And I thought, if God is for us, who can be against us? And I thought about the car that I'd seen broken down on the side of the road up there in the storm. I thought about all the different folks that I'd seen, and somehow I had made it through. And I thought about myself who just kept on going, kept on going no matter what. And for each of us, sometimes the greatest strength we have is to just keep on going, to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus through that pain, through that heartbreak, through that loss, when we're blinded by it all. Because God loves you. And what can separate us? from the love of God, nothing. God loves us so very, very much. Simple prayer at the bottom of your card this morning. It says, I believe you care about everything, Lord, even when I feel alone. Help me find strength in your love and compassion. I'm weak and I falter easily. I want to be more than a conqueror. Help me stand. Henry Nouwen, one of my favorite theologians from my time period in life, wrote this. In the embrace of God's love, we find acceptance, healing, 
and the fullness of life. Acceptance, healing, and the fullness of life. Do you want that? You can find it in the embrace of God's love. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And it's been so many times we've wondered if you even care about the issues that we're facing. And we each one have our own issues of loss, of heartbreak, of pain, of so many question marks that we don't even know how to tell people about what we're going through. And our temptations have just taken a toll, God, that we feel like our faith is not strong enough to stand any longer. We would ask right now that you would lift us up, not that anyone else would see us, but instead that you would lift us up that we might be closer to you. That we might know that we have strength in you today, God. That you would make us more than conquerors in our lives. Lord Jesus, for that one who's experiencing loss today, for that one who's lonely beyond anything they can express, for that one who's in the midst of a heartbreak that seems like home is being ripped away from them. I would ask that you would come and bring the fullness of life with your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Remember there's a program inside or inside your program. There's the announcements for the week to come. Remember tonight we're going to the streets of Los Angeles. Tuesday morning our food packing team meets. Our women's Bible study meets. Wednesday morning we have food distribution. If you need food you're welcome to it. You don't have to wait for Wednesday morning. There is food in the lobby. Thank you Marty and Josh for bringing it in. Um, if you see all those peaches disappear, Josh was just telling me, we have so many peaches around here. We've still got avocados. It was so cool. Marty and Josh went out there and I saw Marty invite all of the medical team from Riverside County into all our food and he just said, go ahead and go shopping you guys. Marty looked at me and said, they were so excited to go shopping and I thought, everyone's ignored them. The entire community's ignored them all day long. They've got, they're professionals, praise God, they're getting something out of it. And so we had the opportunity to be a blessing during that time. So you can be a part of that. There are so many good reasons to be a part of Central Community. Mm. And all you have to do is say yes and come out and you can drive the forklift. This is the truth. I, I posted a picture of everything I unloaded and I put on there, I can't believe I unloaded all that stuff with the forklift. And I was just like, an ex not like bragging, it was just like, whoa, I can't believe that happened. And I had friends calling me and putting on Facebook, next time, call me, next time. And, and that's just the way to all, we think, oh, nobody's there for us. Your pastor thinks that sometimes. And we have to remember there's always people there for us in all these times. Go and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Thank you for being here today. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated, now it is well, I'm walking in freedom.